Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Earthly Headlines. Today we're going to talk about a recent uh, breakthrough in, in technology and, and analysis uh, techniques. And that's being able to reveal through uh, proteins found in the residue of uh, ancient pottery, whether the proteins belong to an animal or a plant. And from here we can uh, derive their exact cuisine, because up until now it's been uh, kind of up in the air. It, it, it was kind of guesswork. Now uh, that we can know definitively the diet of the people, specifically living in 8,000 years ago, uh, Turkey, This uh, we've mentioned it before in the show, uh, Katalhoyuk. It's known, the settlement of Katalhoyuk is one of the earliest known uh, centers of agriculture. And this this place is 8,000 plus years old. And it's really close to Gobekli Tepe, so it makes sense that um, if, if you were to believe the theory that Gobekli Tepe was a center of learning and education specifically for uh, fostering the growth of a civilization, which agriculture is a backbone of, then it makes sense that a nearby uh, powerhouse of agriculture would be a place like Atahuyu. So <clears throat> just really quick through, uh, through this article, the team of scientists use a new approach uh, it's an international team, actually, so this is really, it's like the best of the best from every country involved. Um, they fit, they figured out that the proteins contain, uh, they belong to cereals, legumes, dairy products, including goats and cows, and meat. And in most of the cases, they were narrowing down to uh, the specific species that live there, which doesn't, it doesn't sound like a huge thing is some people are probably surprised that they didn't know this already but they didn't and it it's this is a a, a milestone in getting the really really accurate uh, search results and technology to really pinpoint exactly what was going on back then because remember the ultimate goal is to find definitive evidence as far back as possible to really leave no doubt as to what was going on in our in the ancient past, especially when it comes to humans. So this is a huge, if you were to look at this, you would say that, oh yeah, this is a huge step up in, in, the, in the quality of information that we can uh, glean from this era of, of uh, human, human history. It, it is a big deal, which is why I'm talking about it. So specifically, the researchers analyzed vessel sherds from the west mound of Katahuyuk, and this uh, this time frame, they narrowed this thing to 5900 to 5800 BC. Um, this, so this is towards the end of the site's occupation. What they found were uh, calcified residues on the inside surfaces. So uh, these things are kind of frozen in, in time now. This lime scale residue is very on the inside of cooking pots is also very common. So. What they did was they used the latest up-to-date protein analyses on the samples taken from the ceramics and what they determined was one thing was they were able to determine which animals were actually being used for the milk so some were for being were being used to eat their meat and the others they specifically use for a dairy animal product so the dairy products were shown to have come mostly from sheep and goats and some from uh, the, the bovine family. The non-dairy stuff included meat and blood from the goat and sheep family, and in some cases deer and other cows. The, the plant remains that they found were, what I said earlier, barley and wheat, legumes, peas and vetches. Interesting enough, some pots contained both types of foods in one vessel, so that means they were mixing their foods in their cuisine. So either as a porridge or soup or both. So that's also an interesting nugget of information too, because now we know that they weren't just eating raw food. They were, ac they actually had, they were putting stuff together. They had recipes and formulas for stuff even back then. And that does, again, that doesn't sound like a lot, but remember that's, if you want to, if you're talking about cooking, that can be to, by today's standards, that is considered an art form meaning that there's a pleasing way to do it. There's, there are levels to it, and they've been doing this way back in the day. So I think that the fact that they were cooking stuff and, and using specific ingredients, that's up there with rock art, I think, and, and cave art, um, because that requires some level of intelligence and skill. And an aesthetic, there's an aesthetic to it, 
um, as well. And then uh, another thing we we talked about we did made a cheese video earlier. Uh, some of these finds um, suggested that they were making uh, cheese back then, and they had a bunch of different uh, dairy production methods that separated the fresh milk into the curds and whey. The other interesting thing about this study was the discrepancy between the uh, the, the different protein sequences for different uh, foods. So, for example, there's only six protein sequences for veg in the database, whereas for wheat, there's over 145,000. So an important aspect of future work will need to be expanding these databases with more reference sequences. So basically, they need more uh, protein sequences to identify as markers to see what's what, basically. So in the case of vetch, if there is some other unknown protein sequence that was vetch, well, they wouldn't know it, right? Whereas with wheat, they're, pr they're pretty good on wheat in terms of uh, all the different uh, sequences for that. And the last thing um, the article talks about are, are the other molecular techniques applied to ancient pottery. So uh, they, review they, they separated all their findings into different broad classes of food. So like I said earlier, animal fat, dairy, uh, uh, plants, etc., cetera, uh, non-dairy stuff. Their study was identifying foodstuffs in situ down to the species level. So in samples as old as 8,000 years. So they can get accurate measures from stuff that old. So that's, that's also really important in understanding this whole, this whole concept of uh, people farming back in the day. It's pretty undeniable now. Some people think it's just all hooey and no, no matter what kind of science and no matter how you explain the methods to them, it, it's just... It's just hooey to them, which I guess I can kind of see where they're coming from because they have been wrong in the past, but this seems pretty, uh, pretty ironclad. Uh, in particular, the residues on the insides of the ceramics were exceptionally well-preserved and contained a wealth of information. The removal of these residues can be a common practice among archaeologists as part of the preservation and cleaning process. This is probably something that's going to change. So when an archaeo typically an archaeologist will find a piece of pottery and then they'll just clean it they'll scrub it and make sure that there's any there's no hidden inscriptions or anything like that but the problem is it removes these residues which up until now were kind of like they didn't see any reason to keep them um and in fact they thought it was counterproductive to leave them there because they wanted to preserve the the, the pottery itself so um now we're, we're probably going to see these things are probably going to be collected and kept and at the end of this article, the, the, the scientist is saying, we encourage colleagues to retain them during post-excavation processing and cleaning. So imagine all the information that we just missed out on because we didn't know about this. Um, so that, that should about do it for, for today's episode. I just wanted to um, bring this to light and make sure people knew that there are techniques like this out there and they keep building and building on these techniques. And it's not it's not so, there's no hidden agenda here where they're just trying to pass on their information and and keep their power although that is definitely a thing in in certain especially in academia but this this is just uh proves that they are building this technology in order to make basically for the benefit of everybody who follows it to really elucidate what was going on back then because no Every scientist worth their salt, especially our, uh, people who study history and, and ancient, ancient artifacts and, and megalithic sites and all that stuff, is to get to the bottom of the truth. And the best, as people who live in this day and age who are blessed with all this different technology and the time and, and the funding to really support this line of inquiry, it's probably our duty as stewards of information to really get to the bottom of what was going on back then just to benefit everybody in the now and part of that is developing better tools and and methods and figuring out what to keep and what to discard if we need to discard anything at all to me i think we should just keep everything and, and go through everything with a fine tooth comb and we should do that gener every generation or so just because we can get a fresh pair of eyes looking at the same thing and um, hopefully more information could be gleaned from that. I mean, it's been working so far, and it's only going to uh, increase exponentially, assuming everything in terms of government and, and societal uh, stability is still the same. 
so let me know what you guys think about this uh if you guys know of any other techniques that are that are uh new i mean uh, like let me know in the comments but i i remember i talked about late um they, they they were mapping uh, the landscape under the Amazon with lasers. So that's like a good example of some, some technology that we we're talking about and some methods. So let me know in the comments and uh, I'll talk to you guys later.